Okay, good evening, everybody. We left off at, um, so, there, there are four sections, typically in any catechism. What God has revealed, and how we respond. Two, how we worship as a community. Number three, how we live, right? And number four, personal prayer, or uh, relating personally to God. And so we had start off part of section one, what God has revealed in our response to God's revelation. And then we jumped to uh, section four because it's a short section and just to throw us a little curveball. And I thought I might give you the choice of either what to, to finish off section one and, or to jump to section three. But now that I look how far we were in section one, we, we really need to spend a little time here. What God has revealed and our response to what God has revealed, right? Typically, the response is, is faith and our life of faith. So let's start at 54. We're starting at 54, and this is class number, this is our sixth time gathering together, right? And um, at uh, 54, what are angels? Angels are pure spiritual creatures of God who have understanding and will. They have no bodies, they can't die, and they're usually not visible to us. They live constantly in God's presence and convey God's will and God's protection to humankind. They also bring our prayers uh, to God's throne. An angel, Cardinal Ratzinger, who later become, who became Pope Benedict, uh, is so to speak the personal thought with which God is turned toward me. At the same time, the angels are turned completely toward their creator. They burn with love for God and serve him day and night. Their song of praise is never ending. Uh, in sacred scripture, the angels who have fallen away from God are called devils or demons. Do you know how many different ranks of angels there are? There's nine. Nine ranks of angels. Uh, cherubim, seraphim, principles, powers, virtues, dominations, thrones, dominions, Archangels and angels. So yes, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good question. In fact, it's an insult to Satan. So you think about your generals and your colonels and your majors and your lieutenants and your sergeant majors and Michael is one of the lowest ranking angels. Did you know that? He's a low ranking angel. And Satan was a high ranking angel. And so if Michael can beat Satan up, what does that mean? It means God's all powerful. And that's, a, that's like, um, let, let's, let's use, well, I don't want to use, I was going to use like national and uh, international relations, but that won't, that won't go there. But let's just say that for peace negotiations or to work out a treaty, a nation doesn't send their general, but they send a corporal, right? So uh, St. Michael, who's an archangel, he's like a corporal beating up a general, Lucifer. You know? So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. In fact, uh, these, these movies or these cartoons that show, you know, the devil and the angels, they, they, the demons are no match, even for the weakest angel, you know? So that's part of the reason, yeah. 55, can we interact with angels? Yes, we can call on angels for help and ask them to intercede with God. Each of us has a guardian angel, and it's, it's sensible to have a relationship with your guardian angel. Um, angels can make themselves noticeable if God desires uh, as bearers of a message or helpful guides. Our faith has nothing to do with the false angels of the New Age spirituality and other forms of esotericism. So we shouldn't go out trying to seek messages from angels. We can talk to our angel, and we could ask our angel to guide us, but we shouldn't, shouldn't seek messages. These religions, they're false religions, where people seek uh, to have a seance with religion or to, with angels or, or the dead. That's dangerous, right? So on the right-hand side, let's look at what um, the scripture says there at Psalm 91. 
For he will give his angels charge of you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Right? Kind of a reference to, to guarding angels. I'm going to close the door over here. So let's look and, and see what St. Teresa of Calcutta says and what St. Basil says. St. Teresa of Calcutta says, We long for the joy of heaven where God is. It is within our power to be with him in heaven, even now, to be happy with him in this very moment. But not to be happy with him now means to help as he helps, to give as he gives, to serve as he serves, to save as he saves, to love as he loves, to be with him 24 hours a day, to encounter him in his most frightening disguise. For he has said, what you have done to the least of my brothers and sisters, you do to me. We looked at that quote already. Let's look at what C.S. Lewis says. Everything that is not eternal is worthless in eternity. What does that mean? Anything that's created is worthless when, saw, when seen from uh, eternity, from the vision of eternity. So even this earth is passing away. It's precious. We have to take care of it. It's God's gift. But there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So your video games, your smartphone, or this or that, it cannot, it has no meaning in eternity, right? So to make good use of created things on earth, not to make idols or false gods, because eventually we're going to be unhappy, right? Huh? And we'll be languishing in purgatory for how much time we wasted with created things. So we want to make good use of the short time we have here on earth, right? Finally, what St. Basil the Great says, beside each believer stands an angel as protector and shepherd leading him to life. You know, after evening prayer each night, the church recommends a Marian antiphon. And um, uh, I pray the Marian antiphon after, after night prayer, but not all the time, but many times I place myself under the care of the archangels, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, and I pray a little short prayer that I learned it as a kid. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love entrusts me here. Ever this day be at my side, to light, to rule, to guide, amen. Right? To rule and to guard. You know, so a little poem. So I, uh, you know, especially if I, sometimes I think someone's going to break into my house and beat me up or kill me, you know. So it comes in my head every now and then. So I just place myself under the guardian angel, you know. Anyways, um, let's turn the page. There's a scripture passage there from Psalm number 8. When I look to the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what is humankind that you are mindful of him? What is this, and the son of man that you care for him? In other words, the, uh, the fruit of humanity. Yet you have made him little less than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. Another translation says you have made humankind a little less than a god. Right? So we've been given freedom. We have this opportunity. Can we live forever? Well, our soul lives forever, right? but not by our own power, but by God's power. So, the creation of humankind. 56, does man or humankind have a special place, place, uh, place in creation? Yes. Humankind is the summit of creation. God made humankind in his image and likeness. Humans are clearly distinguished from other living things, animals and plants. Humans are persons, which means that uh, through understanding... He or she can make decisions and decide for or against love. Love satisfies. We were made for love, made for love by love itself. So Blaise Pascal in the upper left-hand corner says, humankind is neither angel nor beast, and unfortunately anyone who tries to make an angel out of him makes him a beast. Do we become angels at any point of our existence? No, never. When we die to become an angel? No, we don't. Um, so we shouldn't say, oh, God needed another angel, or, you know, so-and-so died, Abuelita died, she's our angel. Wrong. Uh, we're going to rise. And for that reason, the angels have an esteem for us because in heaven we're going to have bodies. Resur this, this body is going to be resurrected. Your bodies are going to be resurrected. Even if we burn your body and your ashes blow away, you're still going to be resurrected, right? So that's amazing. 57. How should humankind treat animals and other fellow creatures? Humankind should honor the creator in other creatures and treat them carefully and responsibly. Humankind, animals and plants, have the same creator who called them into being out of love. 
Therefore, a love of animals is profoundly human. Although humankind is allowed to make use of and eat plants and animals, he is nevertheless not allowed to torture animals or to keep them in inhumane conditions. That contradicts the dignity of creation just as much as exploiting the earth thoughtlessly out of greed. So that's, that's what we believe. Other people might, might have us to believe something otherwise, but here we, and there's, that's beautiful. Balance and respect for creation. Now let's see what St. Francis says there. All creatures on earth feel as we do. All creatures strive for happiness as we do. All creatures on earth love, suffer, and die as we do, and therefore they are equally with us, works of the Almighty Creator, our brethren. Uh, you know what? I, I disagree with St. Francis here, you know? So this is not doctrine what he says. Uh, animals don't make choices for happiness, right? Um, they make choices to survive and, and instinct, right? Uh, do they love? No, they don't love. So I, I, if St. Francis said this, uh, yeah, it says, all creatures on earth feel as we do. All creatures strive for happiness as we do. All creatures on earth love, suffer, and die as we do. And therefore, they are equally with us works of the Almighty Creator. They're works of the Creator, but they're not equal to us. So if St. Francis really said that, eh, he didn't study theology, right? So some things he knows, but I, I, I'm thinking, why did they put this in the UCAT? No. Uh, you know, St. Anthony, I wonder if he put the smack down on St. Francis, because St. Anthony was the theologian in the group. But this is, I have problems with this. This is the first problem I've had with the UCAT so far. So doctrine we can't disagree with, right? Do we have to agree with everything that the saints say? No. They can help us to understand the faith, but I, yeah. Man, I'm going to put a little mark here. If anybody's listening at home. Yeah. Um, 58, what does it mean to say that humankind was created in God's image? Unlike inanimate inanimate objects, plants, and animals, man is, humankind is, endowed, is a person endowed with the spirit. This characteristic unites him to God more than his fellow visible creatures. Okay, this I agree with, right? This, I mean, this is what we believe, but this, this, you see a contradiction between what St. Francis said there, right? Dang, okay. Humankind is not a something, but a someone. Just as we say about God, that God is a person, we can say this about humankind. Humankind can think beyond his, his immediate horizon and measure the whole breadth of being. He can know himself with critical objectivity, work to improve himself. He can perceive others as persons, understand their dignity, and love them. Humankind alone is able to know and to love its creator. Humankind is destined to live with God in friendship. Okay, that's right, right? Human beings can't better themselves. A dolphin can't say, you know what, I need to go to classes to become better. I need to love my fellow dolphins better. Okay, dolphins, yeah, they protect each other against sharks and stuff like that. But, oh, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. So on the right-hand column, um, there's a quote from 1 John. That's the scripture. Love is of God, and the one who loves is born of God and knows God. Love looks for the greatest good of the other person. So you young people, what's the purpose of having a boyfriend or a girlfriend? It's to discern marriage. If you're not discerning marriage, have a friendship rather than a boyfriend or girlfriend. It's not so that you can have somebody to hold hands with or to chat with at night or send messages or to go to the movies with or to the dance with or to make out with. Uh, so just be careful, because yeah? the world is giving to you maybe false versions of love. This is why I don't watch uh, James Bond movies, because uh, it's false, uh, totally false. Uh, Austin Powers or any of those stupid movies are. Because it's not love. You know? All right. So 59, why did God make humankind? God made everything for humankind. Humankind is the only creature on earth that has willed, God willed for its own sake. You know, so St. Francis is striking out here. Everything that, that we're reading right now is contradicting what he says in that left-hand side. I'm going to put that in Google to see if St. Francis really said that. Man. Uh, so... God made us for himself and the universe for us. So our response is gratitude. Gratitude is love that has been acknowledged. Someone who is grateful turns freely to the giver of the good and enters into a new, deeper relationship with, with God, with that person. Right? 
God wishes us to acknowledge his love and even now to live our whole life in relationship with him. This relationship lasts forever. Dare we read what Meister Eckhart says on the right-hand side? If the only prayer you said in your life was, I thank you, that would be enough. Hmm. I hope so. God is merciful. The way to be saved is through Christ Jesus. St. Francis, okay? Don't blow it here, buddy. Man is God's image and likeness in which God wants to be honored for his own sake. Okay, that's right. That's right. All right, so there's a letter to Diogenes. Diogenes. God love humankind. For their sake, God created the cosmos. God subjected everything on earth to humankind, gave them the ability to speak and understand, permitted them alone to look up to heaven. He formed them after his likeness. He sent his son to them, promised them the kingdom of heaven, and he will give it to those who love him. Amen. Right? Very good. So, let's go to the next one. Jesus. Why is Jesus the greatest example in the world? Jesus Christ is unique because he shows us not only God's true nature, but the true ideal of man. So, what does Jesus do? He saves us from ourselves, saves us from our sins, saves us from the devil and from hell. And he's our example. He's our example and our teacher. And he himself, it is in and through him that the presence of the Father and the Spirit come to us. Right? Jesus shares with us his Trinitarian inheritance. Jesus was more than an ideal man. Even seemingly ideal men are sinners. That is why no man can be the measure of humanity. Jesus, however, was without sin. We cannot know what it means to be a man and what makes man infinitely lovable in the truest sense of the word, except in Christ Jesus, who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sinning. Jesus, the Son of God, is the authentic, true man. In him we recognize how God willed man to be. God has willed humankind <gasps> to live to know, to love, to live, to serve, right? And so womanhood and manhood is best lived in and through Christ Jesus. The radicalness of our faith is that men and women are equal, right? And so if there's a pay indifference, there should be pay equality, right? Because man is not more than woman, neither is woman more than man, but equal in dignity. Difference in body, difference in soul, different vocations perhaps, and different careers, um, each person is unique, unrepeatable, irreplaceable. And so let's go to what it says on the left-hand side from Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, and part of chapter 16. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. All things were created through him and for him. So imagine this. Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit existed before anything ever was. There never was a time that the Holy Spirit didn't exist. There never was a time that Jesus the Son didn't exist. There never was a time that the Father was alone. One God, right? And so the Father begins to create all things through Christ Jesus in the Holy Spirit. And when God begins to create things, he sends the Spirit out to make things, to create life, to make life, making uh, creation the wellspring of life. There's a, there's a song called God Hovering Over the Waters by Moby. He, he did this in like 1993 or 1994. If you want to Google it or YouTube it, God Moving Over the Waters. Oh, it's a, it's a beautiful song. It's an electronica song. So um, a little tidbit there. <laughs> 61, in what does the equality of all humankind consist? All men and women are equal inasmuch as they have the same origin in the one created love of God. All men and women have their Savior in Jesus Christ. All men and women are destined to find their happiness and their eternal blessedness in God. Hence, all men and women are brothers and sisters. Christians should practice solidarity not only with other Christians, but with everyone, and forcefully oppose racism, sexism, and economic divisions in the one human family. Praise God. This is the good news. What other religions are promoting this? Get out there and share the good news. Receive it. Live it. So at chapter 9 of John's Gospel on the left-hand side, Echeomo, Pilate says this to the crowd, Behold the man. After he has scourged Jesus, he shows him to the crowd. Echeomo. All right. So what is the soul? At 62. The soul is what makes every individual person a human being. 
his spiritual life principle, inmost being, the soul causes the material body to be a living human body. Through his or her soul, humans are creatures who can say, I, and can stand before God as an irreplaceable individual. Okay, so receive this good news. You are unique, unrepeatable, irreplaceable, precious, and loved. Only the specific vocations, only for you. Right? And so uh, this is something beautiful. You have a unique soul, a beautiful soul. So the explanation there says, human beings are bodily and spiritual creatures. A uh, human spirit is more than a function of his body and cannot be explained in terms of man's material composition. Reason tells us that there must be a spiritual principle, an animator, that is united with the body but not identical to it. We call it the soul. Although the soul's existence cannot be proved scientifically, man cannot be understood as a spiritual or intellectual being without accepting this spiritual principle that transcends matter. What were we going to say here? What were we going to say? Ah, uh, yes. The mind, body, spirit, or body, soul, spirit. One of these things doesn't last forever now, the body, but will be raised later in the future. The spirit, or the soul, is that animating principle within us. Sometimes the soul is likened to the ability to have a memory and to reason, and the spirit is likened to our ability to transcend ourselves and to love. Regardless, we're body, soul, spirit, right? So a spirit and body, right? It's important. So we see on the left-hand side there what Pope Emeritus Benedict says. Human beings are truly themselves when body and soul are intimately united. Should he or she aspire to be pure spirit and to reject the flesh as pertaining to his animal nature alone, then spirit and body would both lose their dignity. On the other hand, should he deny the spirit and consider the matter, the body, as the only reality, he would likewise lose his greatness. So if we just live for the body, we're going to diminish our dignity. If we just live for the spirit, and we try to get out of this world uh, without living to the full our vocation, we, we denigrate also our... So that's what Buddhism tries to do. Buddhism tries to escape our bodies because Buddhism sees our body as a prison. Right? So did the ancient Greek philosophy. They saw our bodies as, as susceptible to change, weak, dying, sick. And so the goal was to escape this reality and only be a spiritual being. Likewise for Buddhism, they don't believe in God, but they believe in nirvana. Try and get there right, through your soul, right? Um, so both are incorrect, right? Then there are some pagan religions that just say, okay, do whatever the heck you want. Then you denigrate your spiritual principle, right? So, uh, 63, where does human being, where do human beings get their soul? Human soul is created directly by God, is not produced by the parents. Human soul cannot be the product of an evolutionary development out of matter or the result of a generative union of mom and dad. With every man, every human being, a unique spiritual person comes into the world. The church expresses this mystery by saying that God gives him or her a soul which cannot die. Even if the person loses his body in death, he will find it again in the resurrection. To say I have a soul means that God created, not, created me not only as a creature but as a person and has called me to a never-ending relationship with him. That's beautiful, right? We've been made for eternity. On the right-hand side, there's a quote from Proverbs chapter 31. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are left desolate. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are left desolate. Is this saying, stand up for the little guy? Everyone has rights? I think that's what it's saying. Hmm... Maybe towards the end we'll look up the Bible look, because this translation is a little bit confusing. Open your mouth for the mute. Okay, I think it's saying to stand up for the, for the one who's not able to stand up for themselves. Let's see what St. Hildegard says. The soul speaks, I am called to be the companion of the angels because I am the living breath that God sent forth into dry clay. 
Okay. Uh, will we be with the saints and angels in heaven through Christ? We hope so. And God's living breath having contact with clay made humanity. Okay. Cardinal Schönborn, who is the editor of this book. Humankind is united with all living creatures by his earthly origin, but only through his soul, which God breathed into him, is he human or she human. This confers on him or her an irreplaceable dignity, but also his unique responsibility. Okay, so again, St. Francis is, if we're understanding St. Francis's quote from a few pages earlier, the, it's contradicting. So the, what the cardinal says is right. St. Francis, what he said earlier, I'm sorry. It should be, maybe we can white it out of your, <laughs> you can't, huh? Um, 64, why did God create human beings, male and female? This is great. God, who is love and the archetype of community, created human beings, male and female, so that they can be an image of his nature. God made humans in such a way that they're either male or female and long for fulfillment and completion in an encounter with the opposite sex. That doesn't mean that all of us are called to be married. Yeah? Men and women have absolutely the same dignity, but in the creative development of their masculinity and femininity, they give expression to different aspects of God's perfection. God is not the male or female, but has shown himself to be fatherly and motherly. God is the origin of all life, both male and female life. In the love of man and woman, especially in the com community of marriage, in which man and woman become one, one body, one spirit, they are privileged to sense something of the happiness of union with God, in which every human being finds his ultimate wholeness. Just as God's love is faithful, so also the love seeks to be faithful, as fruitful and creative as God is, because uh, from marriage, the possibility of new life comes forth. Right? Not all of us have the vocation to be married, but we see a new temptation arising People who are born male trying to change themselves into male, or people who are born female trying to change themselves into male. So, is it a sin to change our gender? Yes. We should receive with joy the gender we have, received, we have been given, biological gender. There's only two, male and female. Now, we're, we're wounded, we're fallen. There's confusion, there's, there's wounds that happen, there's confusion. Sometimes people think that they're going to be happy in becoming something else, right? Not the case. We should treat such people with great love and tenderness, right? It could be our family members. It could be our friends, right? But in heaven, will anybody be transgender? No. They're going to be the gender that they always were, that God had given to them, male or female, right? So... Uh, <laughs> We should have a special tenderness for those who have been born hermaphrodite. There are a few hermaphrodites, right? Uh, that a true hermaphrodite has both genders, both genitalia. Such folks are unique. And sometimes science is able to determine whether or not they have more gametes of one or the other. But regardless, we should never make fun of such people. Uh, we should treat them with great tenderness and love. So on the left-hand side, we have some orientating scriptures from Genesis chapter 1. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created humankind, male and female, he created them. Then in chapter 2, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And so he created woman. Here we go, 65. What about people who feel they are homosexual? The church believes that in the order of creation, man and woman are designed to need each other's complementary traits and to enter into a mutual relationship so as to give life to children. That is why homosexual actions cannot be approved by the church. Christians owe all persons respect and love, however, regardless of their sexual orientation, because all people are respected and loved by God, right? So some people say, oh, the church doesn't love homosexuals or they're not welcome at church. Wrong. We have people in our worshiping communities who are attracted to people of the same sex, and they're no less in dignity than anybody else. All of us are deeply loved by God, right? Could there be such thing as marriage between two men and two women? No, that could never happen. Could there be friendships? Of course. 
Could there be self-living and self-sacrificing love? Of course, right? So we want to have the right vision, God's vision, which is of love and of truth. Pope St. John Paul II on the left-hand side, moreover, we read that man cannot exist alone. He can exist only as the unity of two, and therefore in relation to another human person. It is a question here of mutual relationship, man to woman and woman to man. Being a person in the image and likeness of God thus also involves existing in a relationship in relation to the other, I. This is a prelude to the definitive self-revelation of the triune God, a living unity in the communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? So there's, uh, in the explanation now at 65, there is no human on earth who is not descended from a union of a man and a woman. Gametes from a man and gametes from a woman. There it is, therefore, it is a painful experience for many homosexually oriented people that they do not feel erotically attracted to people of the opposite sex and necessarily miss out on the physical fruitfulness of the union between man and woman. Right? Nonetheless, God often leads souls along an unusual path, a lack, a loss, or a wound. If accepted and affirmed, it could become a springboard for abandoning oneself into the arms of God the God who brings good out of everything and whose greatness can be discovered in redemption even more than in creation. So there are those called to the single life, to religious life, but all of us to self-giving and self-sacrificing love. Uh, if we live our lives in love of God and love of neighbor, it's a life uh, of satisfaction. Right? doesn't mean everything's going to go well. doesn't mean there's not going to be difficulties or suffering or weakness. 66, was it part of God's plan for human beings to suffer and die. No, God does not want human beings to suffer and die. God's original plan was paradise, life forever, perfect union with God and the environment. We, we saw about the fall already, I think, but huh? the explanation here. Often we sense how life ought to be, how we ought to be, but in fact we do not live in peace with ourselves. We act out of fear and uncontrolled emotions, We've lost original harmony. Sometimes we have the temptation to selfishness. In sacred scripture, the experience of this alienation is, is expressed in the story of the fall of Adam and Eve. Because sin crept in, Adam and Eve left paradise. They were kicked out. And the harmony they had with God was lost. The toil of work, suffering, mortality, weakness, sickness, death, temptation are signs of this loss of paradise. Concupiscence. So, as you went to Mass this past Sunday, as everybody's going, right? Uh, we heard about the fall of Adam and Eve. They put the blame on each other. They put the blame on the snake. And the Lord prophesies that a descendant of the woman is going to st stomp on the head of the serpent. Yeah. There's some scripture on the right-hand side, and one of them is from Romans. Oh, the scripture there is Romans chapter 5. Where sin increased, grace all the more abounded. Beautiful. Fallen humanity. What is sin? At the core of sin is a rejection of God and the refusal to accept God's love. This is manifested in a disregard for his commandments. So we show love of God at a minimum by living the Ten Commandments and at a maximum by living the New Commandment, the Beatitudes and the works of mercy. When I was hungry, you gave me. When I was thirsty, you gave me. When I was sick, you. When I was a stranger, you. When I was naked, you. When I was in prison, you... And then we add to that, of course, burying the dead. So let's look down at the explanation there. Sin is more than incorrect behavior. It's not just a psychological weakness. It's a rejection or destruction of something good. The rejection of God. In its most profound and terrible dimension, sin is separation from God and is separation from the source of life. That is why death, a consequence of sin... Death is a consequence. Only through Jesus do we understand the abysmal dimension of sin. Jesus suffered God's rejection in his own flesh. He took upon himself, even though he never sinned, he took upon himself all the sins, all the consequences of sin, depression and sadness, so that it would not strike us. The term that we use for this is redemption. Jesus brought us back for God. Let's look at the quotes on the right-hand side. St. John Chrysostom, We have lost paradise, but received heaven, and therefore the gain is greater than the loss. St. Augustine, O oh God, to turn away from you is to fall. To turn to you is to stand up. To remain in you is to have a sure support. 
So let's make our decision and turn towards God. Cardinal Michael von Fallhaber, human weakness cannot upset the plans of divine omnipotence. A divine master builder can work even with falling stones. Finally, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, when Christ's hands were nailed to the cross, he also nailed our sins to the cross. All right, let's turn the page. So it's page 51, and on the left-hand side, what we heard this past Sunday, well, uh, kind of a preface to this past Sunday's first reading. But the serpent said to the woman, when you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. The sin of pride or uh, trying to become like God. Trying to be God. 68, original sin, what does the fall of Adam and Eve have to do with us? Sin, in the strict sense, implies guilt for which one is personally responsible. Original sin refers not to a personal sin, but rather to the fallen state. We're born after Adam and Eve. We are conceived better and after than Eve. It's a disastrous fallen state in which we're born in. Even before we commit our first sin, we're born in original sin, or we're conceived in original sin. So in talking about original sin, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI says that we all carry within us a drop of the poison in the way of thinking, illustrated by the book of Genesis. The human being doesn't trust God. Tempted by the serpent, he harbors suspicion that God is a rival who curtails our freedom and that we will be fully human only when we have cast God aside. Human being does not want to receive his existence and the fullness of his life from God, and in doing so, he trusts in deceit rather than in truth and thereby sinks uh, with his life into emptiness, into death. I use this quote almost every Immaculate Conception. You see that he spoke that his first pope as uh, his first year as pope as Immaculate Conception. He likens original sin to that distrust that we have of God. God wants to control my life, wants me to be a puppet, wants my life to be boring, wants my anxiety to be lame. That's the devil. That's the poison of the devil. If we have that attitude, then we can know that Satan's temptations are rocking around in our head. What is truly of God is life on fire, right? Living life to the full, joy to the full, trusting in God, living the great adventure in and through God, right? So sometimes, I don't know if you young people have fallen into the trap, you know, eh, God is boring, he just, you know, just wants rules and this and that. When, when actually the adults, including myself, we can tell you it's quite the opposite. God is amazing. Only things that God can think of. Yeah, God is amazing. Uh, I got called to the hospital in the middle of the night last week, and a lady was dying, you know? And so they said she only has a few hours left to live. And so she received the, the last sacraments, and people were coming there to pray with her. And after Mass tonight, I, I thought, you know, maybe La Señora murió. I thought she died. I was wondering about her these last days, and someone came up and said, you know what, Father, she's, she's walking. She's going to walk out of the hospital tomorrow. They're going to let her go. And they can't explain why. You know, God is you know, he's not done with her. You know, her mission is not done. So, I mean, who knows? Only God knows, you know, so it's exciting. What else happened? Oh, just a lot of coincidences. God's providence unfolding day to day in God's life. 69. Are we compelled to sin by original sin? No. Just because we're born in the state doesn't mean we're doomed to sin. Human, be human beings, humanity, though deeply wounded by original sin and is inclined to sin, nevertheless with God's help is capable of doing good, becoming holy, being a saint. In no single case are we obliged to sin. In fact, however, we sin again and again because we are weak, ignorant, and easily misled. A sin is committed under compulsion, moreover, there'd be no sin because sin always involves a free decision. So don't encourage other people to sin nor lead others to sin nor desire to sin. It makes us sad. God and love, self-giving love is what leads to joy. Let's look at some quotes there on the left-hand side. Herman Hess. What did he write? Should be, you guys should be reading books by Herman Hess in high school, right? Did he write... Uh, Steppenwolf? No. Uh, 
I wasn't a good reader in high school. Um, I'm a better reader now. Herman Hess. Anyways, a moral approach to the world is possible and beneficial only when one takes upon himself the whole awful mess of life. One share in the responsibility for death and sin, in short, original sin as a whole, and stop seeing guilt always in others. Yeah, we want to stop placing the blame on other people. Take responsibility for our own actions. Leon Bloy, the worst thing is not to commit crimes, but rather not to accomplish the good that one could have done. The sin of omission, which is nothing other than to be unloving and no one accuses himself of it. In what I have done and what I have failed to do, right? So, in other words, what Leon is saying, and he's right, in purgatory, we're going to be like, dang it, I could have helped this poor person, I could have been nicer to that person, I could have been more patient, and now I'm languishing in purgatory a little bit longer than what I needed to, and heaven is still off on the horizon. Everyone who makes it to purgatory makes it to heaven. But we don't want to have regrets. And a life in Christ is a life without regrets. Yeah. If you think about it, in my life, a lot of sins of omission recently, you know. Eh, someone else is going to help that person. Yeah. So let's take an honest look at our lives. 70. How does God draw us out of the whirlpool of evil? You know what a whirlpool is, right? God does not just look on us as man gradually, okay, we gradually destroy ourselves and the world around us, the chain reaction of sins, he sends us Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer, who snatches us from the power of sin. No one can help me. Often, beings, often human beings say this. It's not accurate. Wherever humanity may have strayed by his sins, God the Father has sent his Son there. The consequence of sin is death. Another consequence of sin is being rescued by God. Solidarity of God who sends us Jesus as our friend, our brother and savior. Therefore, original sin in the exalted is called Felix Culpa, or happy fault, which gained for us so great a redeemer. Let's look on the right-hand side there, what it says from the Gospel of John. And the word, now when a word has a capital W, who or what is that? Jesus, right? So when you see word with a capital W, you say, uh-oh, that's Jesus. And the word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. How? In a body. Full of grace and truth, we have beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten Son of the Father. So St. Uh, John the Evangelist there speaks about how he has beheld God's glory in and through Jesus and in his body. Now what does John call the glory of God? Christ Jesus on the cross. That was God's glory. So the world says the glory is rock show. You know, you got all these thousands of people. You got lasers. You got rock and roll and all this stuff. No. The glory is total, perfect, self-giving, self-sacrificing love. And so John says, I have beheld the glory of God. I saw the blood and water flow forth from the wounded side of Christ. This is the glory of the Father. The world says, What? Are you kidding me? He lost. No. He won. And everyone who lives their life in and through Christ is going to win and see greater glory than any rock show or any concert here on earth, right? I like going to concerts. I like rock shows. But it can't compare to Mass. If I had a chance between rock show and Mass, I choose Mass every time. Uh, but if I'm going to go to a rock show, I go to Mass first, right? Because that's the best thing that could ever happen to me in that day. Rock show, okay. Can it save us? No. You know? All right, so now this part deals with Jesus Christ, right? So we've, we've been speaking about God the Father, God the Creator, and now we speak about Jesus Christ. 71. Why are there reports about Jesus called the Gospel, the Good News? Without the Gospels, how many of them are there? Four. But, uh, we would not know that God sends us His Son out of His infinite love, despite our sins, to find our way back to the fellowship with God. 
The reports about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus are the best news that could ever be proclaimed throughout the whole of human history. Jesus, the Jew who was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, who lived in Nazareth, is the son of the living God. He truly took our human nature to himself. He was sent by the Father so that all men and women might be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. That's the good news. So, Jesus says, why are you a Catholic? Well, because my, my mom is or my abuelita is. No, because Jesus is the Son of God and he has been raised from the dead and has opened up the gates of heaven and has t he teaches us the right way to live our human existence. Our life in Christ will manifest itself by the way that we relate to creation, to each other, society. There's a book called The Ducat. I spoke about The Ducat um, at the beginning. This is the Ducat. Ducat is intense. And it has to do with social teaching, working towards social justice. And that's awesome. So let's look on the right-hand side. You see the fish and some Greek words there. It says, ichthus zonton. In Roman catacombs, we find the ancient secret sign that was a profession of faith. Ichthys, if you spell each word out, the letter serves as the beginning of the Greek words, Jesus Christus Theo Huios Soter. Ichthus Sonton means the fish of life, or it means Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior, the source of all life. Boom. Yeah, so that's why the fish was the sign, it was a code word, code sign for our life in Christ. What does the name Jesus mean? Yeshua. It means Yahweh saves. Right? Not Jehovah saves. Jehovah was invented just a thousand years ago. You know? And Jehovah's Witnesses were invented about uh, 200 years ago or less. huh? So uh, Jehovah's Witnesses is a true religion? No, it's not. It's not the religion that God founded. Right? So Yahweh is the name of God. Yahweh saves. Yeshua in Hebrew means Yahweh saves. In the Acts of the Apostles, Peter says, there's no other name in heaven given among humankind by which we must be saved. Yeshua, Jesus, the shortest prayer and the name by which we receive salvation. This is essentially the message that all missionaries brought to people. Okay, let's look and see what C.S. Lewis, uh, Lewis says there. That is one of the reasons why I believe in Christianity. It is a religion that no one could have thought up. You know, he was an atheist for many years and came to know Christ. And later he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia you know, and other books. You know. So if you've ever read those books, you know, he's a deeply, deeply, deeply uh, smart follower of Christ Jesus. Huh? He has other books. Uh, he writes on philosophy. He writes other fiction and writes on theology. Right? Okay, 73, why is Jesus called Christ? Uh, Christ means anointed or Messiah. The brief formula, Jesus is the Christ, expresses, uh, expresses the core of the Christian faith. Jesus, the simple carpenter's son from Nazareth, is the long-awaited Messiah and Savior. Both the Greek word Christos and the Hebrew word Messiah mean the anointed one. In Israel, kings and priests and prophets were anointed. The apostles learned that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. We are called Christians after Christ as an expression of our exalted vocation. When you're baptized, after your baptism, sacred chrism is poured on your head and it's supposed to shine and smell good. Why? Because you're a follower of the anointed one. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. And as a sign that we too are anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, sacred chrism is poured on our head. Sacred chrism is also poured on our head at confirmation. You know, saints have a halo. They glow. If you, if you ever meet a, a saint, light radiates from their face. You know? And so this should be our vocation too, you know? to shine. For, that's tonight's gospel. It's today's gospel. And it says, the reason you do good deeds is not so other people say, oh, you're such a great person. It's so that they glorify the Heavenly Father. Salt and light so that uh, they glorify the Heavenly Father in heaven. So we don't do good things so that people say, oh, you, you must be a good person, you know? 
no, so that so that God can be glorified. So let's see if we could do one more. 74, what does it mean to say that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God? When Jesus calls himself God's only begotten Son, and Peter and others bear witness to this, this expression means that all of all men and women, only Jesus is more than a man. In many passages of the New Testament, and they're put there, John 1, John, 1 John chapter 4, Hebrews 1, Jesus is called Son. At his baptism and transfiguration, the voice of the Heavenly Father calls Jesus my beloved Son. Jesus discloses to his disciples his unique, his unique relationship to the Heavenly Father. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. The fact that Jesus Christ really is God's Son comes to light after the resurrection. So we, we, we came to the conclusion of the section, this first section, that uh, reveals that uh, God the Father is creator. And so what we want to do now